in the painful silence of bare lands. In the whisper of changing sands. Like a cry in agonizing birth. <laughs> Hear the calls of life, the groans of earth. For all who live upon this soil. To survive, they must toil. But for men and earth to give their best, in due time, they both cry for rest. Life in the desert margins is a matter of give and take. Man must give the land proper care to continue taking what he needs to survive. The scarcity of rain in these areas makes this a more delicate situation. This is true for most of southern Africa, where more than 90% of the land is slightly less arid than the typical desert. Dry lands like these cover one third of the Earth's land surface. Climate changes and human activity threaten to degrade these areas towards desert-like conditions where fewer inhabitants would be able to survive. This is the reason for the Desert Margins program in line with certain objectives of the United Nations Convention to combat desertification. The Desert Margins program operates in nine African countries. Its purpose is to arrest land degradation and promote alternative livelihoods. Working at ground level in South Africa, the Desert Margins program knows the condition of the land and it has a story to tell. It can tell what it has heard from the voices of the dry lands. In the southern Kalahari, between the Namibian and Botswana borders, in the northern Cape province, lies the Mir district. It is arid with sensitive, sandy soils. <laughs> Livestock farmers live a hard life between its soft red dunes. Here, Ger Titis shepherds a flock of almost 400 sheep and goats. There is no water on the land, where he has been farming for about 20 years now. Every second to third day, Gert must walk his herd three kilometers to and three kilometers from a watering point on another farm. The vegetation en route is heavily trampled. The dunes are bare and eroding. Gert knows what would improve his situation. As a man, you water of your place here, you can better and as you know, no can come for grey as a dog weather. Paddocks would allow Gert to control grazing. While certain paddocks could be open to grazing, others could be closed to rest and revive the vegetation. However, Gert does not own the farm and he does not see sufficient reason to invest in it. Gert also does not remove the three-thorn bush, an invader plant, because he says that his animals like to eat its flowers and leaves. Now that is a problem with the three-thorn. The man who had them now ate all of them. Now ate, but he had them now sickly. The Desert Margins program encourages farmers in this area to remove this bush, so that more nutritious plants can grow. 
Gert does take some advice, especially that given on his favorite radio program. Wat ek nou like om te luister is hier landbouw radio, hier so met 12 uur as ek nou hier by die huis is. Ek het baie geleer ook daar deur al veel bestuur. Goeiemiddag en ons sê baie welkom by RSG Landbouw. Ons staan so in die begin van die week en ek hoop dat die week vir die daar... Gert loves the Kalahari and hopes his children will own a piece of its land. Not far from Gert, Kurs Smith also farms with livestock. However, his approach is different. More than 40 years ago, Kurs took the risk of sinking a borehole with his own money on this farm that was not his at the time. It only became his property more than 20 years later. He believes that you must invest in the land. As you need to carry the warning, the the fatty wind, because as you know, over the last three years, what they call us, on our ano urban it, then the salary must now be on board. Kurs also took the advice of researchers and began removing the three-thorn bush. Now, more palatable vegetation stands in its place. Though he is over 70 years old, Kurs is still ready to learn. You must be ready to learn, to learn, and to listen, and to look, and then to your field. If you don't have to pass, then you go to the and you don't have to go any further. Another eager learner in Mir is Kuli van Weyck. He attends farmers' workshops and tests what he is taught. He learns what livestock breeds are best to farm with and how to manage his land. This has led to his farming success. I don't want to have my children to come as what I have come. It must go better with them. And I myself will have to the last few years that I live, I will have to live a little better. And then when I begin to listen to what others say, a little bit of a cup, and a little bit of a round to look, how that other people have made it to go better. Kuli is better off. Solar power replaces gas power, and motor vehicles replace donkey transport. He has also built himself a brick house and given his children university education. Kuli also has strict rules for his game farm to control the numbers of wild antelope that are hunted in order to protect the vegetation. One particular hunter thought Kuli to be too strict. We must try to preserve it. We begin with what, but we must preserve it. There must be something to stay. And when I my reels get to say later to my man, but it looks like your world is very much less than your reels is. Because the hunter did not agree to Kuli's rules, he was turned down along with the money he offered. It's sometimes difficult for established farmers to accept different ideas based on research done in this area. Youth do not have such fixed mindsets and are easier to teach. The Desert Margins program works with the government's land care program to bring school groups to the Kalahari to introduce them to better land practices. Here, future landowners learn what plants are preferable and how to plan a farm with watering points and grazing systems. Seppi Esterhuizen from Landcare believes the children need to understand the value of the country's natural resources. Van jongs af moet ons besef dat ons natuurlijke hulbronne bepaal eindelijk ons vooruitgang hier in Zuid-Afrika. The land of the Malupu lies on the western side of the northwest province. It looks lush, diverse and plentiful. 
However, drought can strip it of vegetation and leave its inhabitants in desperate need. Communal farmland poses different challenges, as here farmers use a continuous grazing system. Their animals graze off all the land, and at times too many animals graze in small areas, leaving vegetation sparse. Yeah, like you say, this is... Government extension workers cooperate with the Desert Margins program to advise these farmers on how to manage their land best, by giving it time to rest and not overstocking it with animals. Extension workers know the land areas they work in well and are fit to train others. One such worker is Joseph Nyamule. Ernest Paul is a communal farmer in the Malopo. He wants his herd of cattle to have good grazing land. But this is not always the case. Kante naha isiame kerona re sai sireletseng ka go yena ya lo bakalwa gore re bone gore ha puladina a go tswa seng Ernest relies on his cattle to survive but his cattle also rely on him He believes that if he looks after them well they will be more profitable for him oh, oh. Franz Sataye is also a communal farmer in the Malopo. Like Ernest, Franz cares for his livestock and the land. He has taken the advice of extension workers to move his herd according to seasons, and he can see how this benefits him. This is Namako land and part of the succulent Karoo biome, one of the richest succulent deserts in the world. Here on the western side of the Northern Cape province lies the village of Poleshook. It's small, remote and home to about 600 residents who are either unemployed or live of a very low income from livestock farming or temporary jobs elsewhere. Many are dependent on disability or pension grants. To contribute to their livelihoods, the Desert Margins program encourages residents to have their own vegetable gardens. To Getreide Brandt, her garden is the beginning of greater things. Desert Margins program representatives provide training, seeds and garden tools to eager gardeners. One of these representatives and a researcher in the area for the past seven years is Lee Simons. There is a need for um, alternative ways to bring in not just income but something in kind as well. Um, and that's where the food garden project definitely steps in. It allows for something tangible in people's lives, um, something that they can take pride in. Gardeners must watch out for foraging donkeys in the town. These donkeys also eat much of the grazing vegetation around Poles Hook. Most are wild and have no owners. Gert Joseph stays close to his herd 
and has seen how the donkeys trample the vegetation. Here in Canada, we feel a draw felt stand. And as you hear donkeys in sit, or a man, as you come now, like it, you die, you die, you die, you die, you die, you die, you die. Once land is trampled, the presence of unpalatable and poisonous plants increases. Gert keeps his animals from eating too much kraal bush, which causes abdominal swelling. The Desert Margins program works with the Agricultural Research Council to research how resting the land can help in solving such problems. Gert Joseph has more land and he practices nomadic grazing. He's careful not to allow land areas to become degraded. For Gert and other farmers in the area, it's their knowledge of the land that keeps them alive. A knowledge passed down from generations who have walked the land and monitored its condition. Although livestock is the major concern in the dry lands, other uses of the land deserve equal consideration. The Sait Bockefeld also lies in the northern Cape province. It's unique in that it shares in the Cedarberg sandstone mountains the only place in the world where wild rooibos, a herbal tea shrub, grows. Here, small-scale farmers produce the richest flavoured rooibos tea. Generations have farmed with rooibos tea, but with poor access to markets and low profit returns. They could barely make a living. Now, local farmers like Kurs Polsa are part of the Hayfelt Cooperative. They formed the cooperative with the help of the Desert Margins Programme and a non-governmental organisation, the Environmental Monitoring Group. Now they have their own facilities and an international market eager to buy their produce at a price it deserves. What do they think of land conservation? Very important. Want het bestaan van ons is dat de grond bewaar om ons leven heel te maken op die grond. Maar als ons die grond dat niet bewaart, dan kan ons niet bestaan te worden. Rhoda Lowe has researched the differences between rooibos grown in cultivated lands and wild rooibos harvested in the natural vegetation, as well as how the local people farm sustainably with wild rooibos. Our argument is that if one tries to use the, the wild tea sustainably and if you can conserve the natural habitat of the wild tea, not only are you looking after the wild tea as a, as a, as a subspecies or a species, but you're also then looking after the other co-occurring species. In her research, Rhoda learned much from the practices of these farmers. They farm organically in that they do not use pesticides, even when growing seedlings. They also leave vegetation strips between their cultivated lands to conserve natural vegetation and reduce wind erosion. This kind of indigenous knowledge often comes through personal experience. Hendrik and Susanna Hesselman have lived in this area all their lives. At first, they only farmed with livestock. Later, they put their bread money into raising their first crop of rooibos tea, but lost it due to wind erosion. Now they sow rye between the tea plants to protect them. Yo, man, gee, elkies wat ons gaat, dit ons nou alles daar aan gesteek. En nou sit in ons verlies die die plankies het dood dood gebaar. Maar daar is wat ons toe moet die rooibelt heb geplant het, is wonderlijk. For Hendrik and Susanna, their success has not come easily. This is not a hard work. This is a hard work. 
en je moed moet recht zijn. Je moet niet voor dagen moet dit niet aan morgen. Nee, ik zal niet morgen weer gaan werken. Farmers like Hendrik and Susanna now share their hard-earned knowledge with younger, less experienced farmers. The Desert Margins program, through the Hayfeld Cooperative, provides opportunities for this. Most farmers want to participate because they want to conserve the land that they depend on. Life in the drylands is not always easy. People here may have different uses for the land, but they know that in whatever they do, they must use the land with care if they are to succeed or simply survive. The land is their basis for life. Thus, the Desert Margins program bases its activities in the drylands on the interests of the people. This is a vital lesson that the Desert Margins program has learned, according to its global coordinator, Dr. Sado Koala. The most important key is to involve the rural communities, is to provide them with livelihood. And this livelihood can serve as an entry point as well as a basis for the work on land degradation. Through the sands of time, voices have their turn to tell how they live, to share what they learn. Their common purpose stands. To live, we must care for Earth. Heed the voices of the dry land.